Okay, title I have for you tonight is, like the old gospel song, Why Me, Lord? Now, I want to be clear from the beginning that I am not going to suggest that there's anything about anybody, any of us, that uh, makes us worthy of what God has. There is one condition that it says to please God, and that is faith. And it says, go to Romans chapter 12. It says that God has made it possible for every person to exercise faith. You know, that's why in Ephesians chapter 2, when it says, well, no, actually it, it, it's in Romans chapter 4, and we'll get to that in a minute. But in Ephesians 2, it says, by God's grace you are saved through faith. Okay, and that that's not of works. So, when we are talking about faith, we're not talking about a work, nor are we talking about some special something that's in some people, that in their personality, and other people don't have that. Because it says here in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of himself or of his importance or ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has apportioned to each, that is to every person, a degree of faith. Okay, so everybody can believe. Now, does everybody believe? No. And I will have to say that when I look at such a, a mob of humanity rushing headlong down the, the, the broad way that leads to destruction, and I'm trudging along that narrow way that leads to life, I ask, Lord, why me? Why am I doing this and all of them are not? <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to address that today because actually there's something else in the, the, the new edition of the Amplified in the brackets after that last sentence that I read. It says that God has apportioned to each a degree of faith or the way I would translate that, the ability to believe. And that God has a purpose designed for our serving Him, our service. Okay, so I'm not just talking about how come we're saved and uh, so many others aren't. I'm not, well, let's just leave that one behind for a moment. And let's talk about why God would like us who have received, who have been saved, who are saved why he would like us to go on toward spiritual maturity. And why, just like with salvation, every person can do that. You know, it almost seems like, well, some Christians, they're just not equipped to... You know, sometimes it's like they're not even equipped to be spirit-filled or something. Well, that's not right. That's not right. Everything that God has is available to every Christian. Is every Christian going to get it? Well, no, but it's back to that faith thing. Now, let's, let's first of all, before we di dive into that, let's talk about God's plan and His purpose for humanity. Go to Hebrews. Keep the place in Romans. But go to Hebrews chapter 2. You know, we've talked before about Lucifer's fall. About Lucifer was the anointed cherub 
that covered the throne of God. And he sinned because he was jealous of the power that God had and he wanted to take that for himself. And so he was fired, shall we say. And it was after that that God created humanity. And God created humanity very special. That, okay, you know, talking about, well, you know, no, no human is more pre preferred to God than other. He says he's not a respecter of persons. But God does prefer humanity over the other spirit beings that exist. He does prefer us over angels and over cherubim and seraphim and, and uh, whatever else is out there. And I don't think we even know really what all else is out there. But he prefers us to them. It says so. I'm going to read it. It says here in Hebrews chapter 2. Let me read verse 6 first. One has solemnly testified in Scripture saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Why me, Lord? Or why not just me, but why humanity? Why, why are we special? Or the son of man that you graciously care for him? You have made him for a little while lower in status than angels, but you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, confirming, his, confirming humans' supremacy. But it goes on to say, but now in putting all things in subjection to man, he left nothing outside of man's control. But at present, we do not see all things subjected to man. Right? So it's like we have a destiny. We have a divine uh, appointment to rule as God's vice sovereigns. But we're not there yet, obviously. And the devil is bound and determined to keep us from getting there. But I want you to see what it says in verse 5. But it was not to angels that God subjected the world of the future, like when Jesus comes back to rule and reign, of which we are speaking. Okay, so we are destined for rulership. And really, Jesus' name, really the whole Bible is the story of humanity being prepared for that job. That's the purpose of the Bible. You know, there are some things about the universe that the Bible is, is really not concerned with because it doesn't really concern us. You know, some people say, well, the, the Bible doesn't talk anything about uh, Pluto or about you know, uh, solar flares or, well, actually, it probably does talk about solar flares, but, but, you know, that there are certain things in science and in astronomy that we don't find that information in the Bible because it do, those things don't have to do with what God is preparing us for. We have a mission. Humanity has a mission to be made like God so we can do the, the kind of things He does. And in fact, truth be told, we already have some of those divine capacities that angels don't have. For example, you know, I say this all the time, Satan can't create. He can only pervert. Humans can create. If nothing else, humans can create works of art. Humans can create architectural buildings. They can, and not only that, for that matter, animals can do some things angels can't do. Animals can reproduce after their own kind. Angels cannot reproduce after their own kind. That's what the whole thing in Genesis 6 was about. Okay? So, but see, it's like we've got the best of, of angels and the best of animals all put together in our species. Right? They can't create. We can create. But it says here, it was not to the angels that God subjected the world of the future. Well, then let's see what this business of, of being, uh, you know, having things subjected to us is. Go to Genesis chapter 1. 
See, all of this is to answer the question, well, why me? Why us? Well, God wants us to know why us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image. Now, Dr. Michael Heiser has an interesting linguistic uh, explanation of that that goes a little bit beyond most Bible translations. He says that in, in that phrase in Hebrew, for something to be in the image, doesn't, it's not like that painting over there is an image of a tree. He said for something to, to be an image of it, it's like you have a, a mental picture. Okay, it's like God, God has a mental picture of us being like Him which means he has a plan for us to be like him. And that would be why when he saved us, it says the plan of salvation was, was laid out even before we were created. It's like God already knew we were going to mess up, and so he said, okay, you know, I've got that covered too. And he would become like us. You know, it says the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the earth. That means it was already in the mind of God before we were even here. All right, so that that idea of being made in His image means that, that God imagined us to be like Him, and so He wants us to imagine us being like Him. That that's what being made in His image means. It does, doesn't mean God has two arms and two legs, or Jesus does, but God is a spirit. Okay? Anyway, let's keep reading. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created them. Male and female. Well, see, there's another proof right there that he's not saying humans are supposed to look like God because God, sorry feminists, everywhere it talks about God, it's always male. Okay? And the second person of the Trinity is a male. Some will say, well, the Holy Spirit's a female. No, the Holy Spirit is a spirit. <laughs> okay? Actually, in the Bible, when it refers to the Holy Spirit, it refers to the Holy Spirit in the male pronoun, too. So, so then, well, does that mean women are second-class creatures or they're left out of the plant? No, it means that, that God created women to be like him just as much as he created men to be like him. Okay, so that should satisfy any feminist Christian out there. It, it really should. You know, you're not left behind the door on anything that God has. You know, the, the transformation that's available to a man is available to a woman. So let's leave that one behind. Okay. And then God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subjugate it and put it under your power and rule and have dominion of the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and of every living thing that creeps upon the earth. And that right there is what Satan was jealous of and caused him to go to Adam and Eve right away and tempt them so that they would be corrupted and so that they wouldn't be able to fully do what God had intended for them to do. And so, see, that's, that's why the devil brought sin into the world because he thought, well, then, as long as they're corrupted by sin, then they can't fulfill that divine mission that God has given to them. But the devil is wrong because God sent his son to undo that so that we can still fulfill that mission. But we've got to do it the way God says. And unfortunately, not everybody really wants to do that. But it's available for everybody. In fact, go to uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7.
in the, the, the story that the Bible lays out, there is God selecting a man, Abraham, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and then through him, God continuing his work in humanity to bring us along to where God ultimately wanted us to be. And remember, with God, a thousand years is as a day. So the fact that it's taken all these thousand years for this project to go on is nothing to God. Nothing at all. Well, uh, I mean, you know, most of us haven't lived a thousand years yet. So, you know, once a thousand years, there's something I've learned about running. The further you go, the quicker it seems like those miles go by. Now, I mean, now it, you reach a point in a marathon where, you know, after you've done about 20, you think, well, that's, you're never going to get to the end of there. But if you've run two or three miles, then from, from mile three to four seems like it goes by a lot shorter than from mile one to mile two. There's just something about that. Once, once, you have, once you've gotten started in something, it's like there's some momentum that grows. See, a big thing that happens... Uh, I was talking with Steve today about stuff on the internet, and it's like we both were kind of uh, bemoaning the fact that, you know, us baby boomers are just, we don't pick up on this technical stuff like some of the younger people do. And, and I was saying, well, but you know what? They started, when they were little bitty, they started playing these little video games, and that trains that by the, fa by the time they're old enough for school, having done all of that, they already know, well, you push buttons and this, you move this thing from here to there and this thing goes flashing and you, you, you click on it and all of that, all the same stuff that you have to do to work on the internet. And so, it's like anything else. You know, the first time I played piano, it didn't sound very good. <laughs> right? So, anything that we do, it's going to start off slowly. It's going to start off, it's going to be hard at the beginning. And, and okay, and yes, okay, some people maybe are uh, genetically predisposed that they have a talent towards certain things, but that talent doesn't apply to everything. You know, maybe they're a child prodigy in music, but they're not so good at auto mechanics, <laughs> right? Or maybe you're real good with mechanical stuff, but you, you, you don't write poetry very well, or, you know, however it works. I, let, let's move on. Anyway, uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're talking about why God uh, chose to work through Israel. That is, why he chose to work through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to bring the Messiah, even, forth through that lineage. Why did he do that? I mean, why, why them? Why the Jews? Why not the, the Eskimos? Or why not the, you know, the Native Americans? Or why not the, the Arabs? Or why not other groups? You know, why did he choose them? Well, we're going to answer that. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a holy people set apart to the Lord your God. And by the way, you know, if we're Christians, this applies to us too. Not, you don't have to be a Jew to be a holy person. All right? And the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be a people for his own possession. And now here, here we go, verse 7. The Lord did not love you or choose you because you are greater than number than any other peoples. For you were the fewest of all people. Well, you know what? The same, the same mindset seems to work in Christianity. It's like, well, you know, if you don't have a big church and there's something wrong with you, and God says, here, the numbers do not matter. Or, or did I read that wrong? In fact, this word fewest, it's interesting. Uh, number 4592 in Strong's Concordance, it doesn't just mean few in number. It can also mean insignificant. It can mean ineffective even. Weak. Uh, keep the place here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
I read this a lot, but I think it applies. He's saying that you don't have to be numerous, you don't have to be powerful, you don't even have to be influential. Now see, that's something the church really kind of... I'm not saying it's wrong to want to have a big church. And I'm not saying that big churches by definition are... Uh, corrupt or they're evil or, or something like that. But it's like if that's the only model, if size is what everybody thinks matters, then what about quality? What about maturity? What about understanding? What about revelation knowledge? Uh, what about... Uh, people being able to pray for one another. I mean, there's all these other things that, you know, if you go to a church and you just want to be able to walk in and just be a number in the crowd, and you want to be able to leave and, and be unnoticed, um, is that really the, the best kind of church? Well, a lot of people think it is. And, and I'm saying, just because it's big doesn't mean it's better. Anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 it says, God has selected for His purpose the foolish things of the world. Well, there's ineffective, right? The foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has selected the weak things of the world to shame the, to shame the things which are strong. And God has selected for His purpose the insignificant, things of the world, that the, that the things that are despised and treated with contempt, that he might use those to reduce to nothing the things that are. It's kind of like in Revelation where it says that he will make those of the synagogue of Satan bow down at your feet and, and admit that God has loved you. Well, sure, but, but let me say... That doesn't mean that, well, if you're wealthy, then God doesn't want you. I mean, hey, you know, if there hadn't been wealthy Christians throughout the history of the church to fund missionary efforts and to build churches and to, to promote the gospel, where would we be today? See, I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian if you're rich or you can't be a Christian if you're a, a strong athlete or something or you can't be a Christian if you're a college professor. Of course, my dad's told that joke about, you know, the college professor and the preacher both died and went to heaven and the, the preacher got a little cabin and the college professor got a mansion and, and the preacher said, hey, wait a minute, you got us mixed up. And, and St. Peter said, no, we got a lot of preachers here. We don't have very many college professors. <laughs> So anyway, so it's not saying you can't be one of those. Well, I mean, you know, it almost sounds like he's saying that. But you put this with the scripture says God is not a respecter of persons. Then it's not that God is rejecting someone because they're wise or they're powerful or they're strong. The problem is it has to do with faith because if people are, think they're sufficient in and of themselves, they're not going to seek God. And this is part of the why me. We'll, we'll get to this in a minute. You, you, you ask yourself, or, you might, or you're asking God. You're, within yourself, you're wondering, well, what did I do to deserve the revelation that God's given me? Well, okay, there is something that you did that other people who didn't do that, that kept them from getting it. And that is you sought God. You, you wanted it. And when it was presented to you, you accepted it. Okay? And they could do that too. There's nothing in your makeup that, that made you more capable of doing that than them. Well, we'll get to that. Anyway, go back to Deuteronomy. Let's finish this. Deuteronomy 7, verse um, 8. But because God loves you, and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers. See, God swore an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Well, an oath is a solemn command. 
An oath is not just a promise. I mean, the, the Bible is full of promises, but an oath, it's like God, God is saying, if I don't do this, then I'm not God. It's like he, he you know, it's like there, it says in Psalm that he honors his word above his name. You know, people used to do that, and now they don't. You know, we were, I was talking with my son about a mechanic today, and, and, you know, we were talking about, well, he didn't think this mechanic uh, gave him the full disclosure of everything that was wrong with his car. And I told him, I said, well, you know what? Unless you're a regular and you know that guy and he's your friend and you've got a good relationship with him, they're not going to tell you everything that's wrong. You know, you say, well, I want you to fix that. You bring it in there, they'll fix that. And thank you, bye, and give me the money. And it's like, it used to be that your reputation was on the line when you do that, but is it that way anymore? No. Well, anyway, it is with God. That's what an oath is. You know, um, the Lord swore an oath to your fathers, and he brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and he redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, no without any doubt, and understand that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who is keeping His covenant. Now, a covenant is kind of like an oath, but literally, it's even more <laughs> gruesome than that, because an oath, I mean, a covenant, actually means a cutting. It has to do with, with meat. It has to do with a creature being killed and its blood being shed and it being cut in half. That's what he did with Abraham. And it says that God walked down the middle between the two pieces. Well, see, what a covenant is, it's more than, see, an oath is, is just God saying, well, I'm going to do it or else I'm not God. But a covenant, God says, I'm going to do it. Now, what are you going to do? It's like he's on this side and you're on that side. So what, see, that's a cutting. That means that there, there's a path down the middle, but you've got to do your part too. And he says he made a covenant, and he keeps his covenant uh, to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. Well, now, we have a better covenant than Israel did. But the point is, is that's part of the why me. Is God will put a, an opportunity for a covenant. And then, will you take it or will you not take it? Go to Romans chapter 4. So, we've mentioned Abraham. We mentioned Isaac and Jacob too. But let's start with Abraham. Why did he choose Abraham? Why not uh, Amir or Joe Blow or whoever else was out there in Ur of the Chaldees at that time? Well, we'll look into this a little bit. Um, Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, humanly speaking? What did he find? How did he obtain a favored standing? For if Abraham was justified by works, those things that he did that were good, he has something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, whatever Abraham had, his wealth, his, uh, you know, he was a decent, he was a good citizen of the community or whatever it was. It's like, yeah, okay, compared to other people, maybe he looked really good, but God didn't, it says God didn't consider that. That, that wasn't why God selected Abraham. That's what he's saying here. So he didn't select him because of what man would think was, was worthwhile. Okay, well, what does the Scripture say? Well, Abraham believed in, he trusted and relied on God, and that was accounted to him as righteousness. Okay, so this is, this is the essence of why me. It's like, okay, why, why are you here? Why did you receive and your classmates didn't? 
Because you believed the word that was preached to you. Now, we're going to dig a little deeper in that. I, I'll give you maybe five more things about believing that, that matter in this. But while we're talking about Abraham, let's look at this a little more. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Because Abraham is kind of our mentor. You know, it says in the New Testament, he's, he's our father too as Christians, just as much as he was the, the natural forefather of the Jews. Well, he's kind of the spiritual forefather of the body of Christ. You know, it says we're of the seed of Abraham by our faith, right? Okay, so what, is, what, what does Abraham have to say about us? Well, in Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called by God, now, when were any of us called by God? Well, when we first encountered Him, or the Word, His Word came into our world, and we had to respond to it. Okay? When Abraham was called, he obeyed, going to the place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went not knowing where he was going. Well, you know what? We don't know where we're going neither, do we? I mean, we, re we can read about it, but we hadn't been there. In fact, there's nobody that I've heard of that's been there to manifested sonship and been taking a time trip into the millennial kingdom of, you know, 300 years from now and come back and say, oh, it's going to be great. Y'all will love it. You know, nobody's done that. So we don't know where we're going, do we? Just like Abraham. Okay? But he, when, he, when he was called and the message came to him, he responded. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. And I might add, he didn't always respond perfectly. You know, he kind of he took a few steps back so, sometimes when, when God told him something he kind of said, well, yeah, but, and, and, you know, kind of went his own way for a while. I can relate to that. <laughs> I've done that a few times, and it's not pretty. Okay, Genesis chapter 12. It says, now, the Lord said to Ar Abram, that's Abraham, go away from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. You know, that's kind of like God calling somebody, uh, leave the lifestyle, you know, you're in, you're in a sinful lifestyle, leave that behind. It's like, well, yeah, but this is all I've known. It's like, well, I got something better for you. Right? He says, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you abundantly, and I'll make your name great, exalted, and distinguished. You shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth, or, and you, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that's not just, well, he became famous. Okay, there was that. And it's not just, well, um, God fulfilled the promise that he would have heirs you know, children, because he didn't. You know, he and Sarah was barren, and so he didn't have any children. Go, for that one, go to Genesis chapter 15. It says, and after these things, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, right? That's what he believed. The word of the Lord. The word came to Abram in a vision even. Now, we got it in, in black and white, right? Firmer still, yes. But it came to Abraham in a vision, and God said, Well, do not be afraid. I am your shield, and your reward for obedience shall be very great. And, and Abraham turns around and, and questions God about it. He said, Oh, yeah? Well, he says, Well, Lord, 
What reward will you give me since I'm leaving this world childless and he who will be the owner and heir of my house is this servant of mine, Eliezer of Damascus. And he went on. He didn't stop there. He said, well, since you've given me no child, one who's the servant in my house is going to be the heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him. See, there's a pattern here. Is If God tells us something, and we question him about that, he's going to tell us something else. He is going to confirm his word. There's a principle, let every word be established two or three times. You know, he's not just going to tell you once and, well, you missed it. Well, too bad, you missed it. No, he's going to keep talking until we acknowledge that we've heard. Now, that doesn't mean that all you've got to do is hear. It does say in James, you've got to, you've got to put feet on your faith. That's why... That's why in the case of, of Abraham, it's that he obeyed. That, that's, that's part of this. But let's go on. It says in verse 5, So the Lord brought Abraham outside his tent and said, Well, now look now toward the heavens and count the stars if you can, if you're able to count them. And then God said to him, Well, that's how numerous your descendants will be. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling. Abraham said, look, I, I'm, I'm an old man, and my wife can't bear, and I'm, you know, I'm going to die one of these days, and this servant's going to get all of my things. And God said, look up there, that's how many descendants you're going to have. But Abraham believed God, and God counted that to him as righteousness. Okay, and so that opened the door for the promise that God had made to Abraham to happen. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 12. Let's talk about us now. You know, we, we believed. That's how you get saved, you believe. But you know what? It works for other things besides just getting saved. It works for you receiving the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit, you receiving miracles, healings, you receiving transformation, you receiving deliverance, you receiving uh, escape from catastrophes. You got to believe. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is chastising the people in some of the towns where he ministered where they did not believe. Okay, uh, Matthew 12, verse 41. It says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment against this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But now something greater than Jonah is here. Okay, so he is pointing out one of the responses of faith is to repent. Now, repent, we've talked about this before, repent really literally means to change your mind. See, our, our behavior, even our words, uh, begin in our minds. I've heard the saying, that watch what you think because that will become what you say. And watch what you say because that will be what you end up doing. And watch what you do because that will become a habit. And watch what your habits are because those become lifestyles. And that's how a sinful lifestyle starts with a thought. Okay? Well, what he's saying is, when the word came to Nineveh, they repented. They accepted that word and they said, okay, we're going to change. We're, you better change your evil ways. Never. Okay, anyway, whatever. So, uh, verse 42. The queen of Sheba will stand up as a witness at the judgment against this generation and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and now, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, 
I wouldn't say you all have come from the ends of the earth, but both of you had to drive quite a few miles to get here tonight. That's really kind of what he's talking about, really, is what the Queen of Sheba did is she valued the word of God that she had heard that this Solomon king over in Israel had. She thought that was so important that she would go to the trouble of saddling up her camel and hooking them over there to here. And, you know, and that was... Sheba is like Sudan or somewhere in, in Africa. I mean, that's hundreds of miles, maybe a thousand miles from Israel. She had to go to some trouble to get there. Now, she was the queen, so she had the resources to do it. But my point is, she valued the word. You all value the word. That's why you're here. Okay? And you on the internet, you wouldn't be listening to this unless you thought that what we're talking about here is something important enough for you to watch this instead of NBA basketball or something else, right? Okay, well, that's valuing the word. Just like repentance is an expression of faith, valuing the word is an expression of faith. Okay? Go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. See, these answer the question of, well, why me? What did I do that these other people didn't do? Well, you repented. <laughs> you quit thinking about, you know, drugs, sex, and rock and roll, and booze, and pot, and everything else that tickled your fancy, and you started thinking about the things that are pure and wholesome and, and that pleased God. Okay, that's, that's called repentance. And then... When, when you heard the word from Owen Cain or whoever you hear it from, or you're hearing it from me right now, you value it. It's like, okay, th this is good. I, I, need to, I need to get this. I need to get a hold of that. We'll keep doing that. That's faith. You know, that's, you, you say, well, why me? Well, that's why you. Because you've done that and you keep doing it. Don't stop. Okay, you, you want to get to spiritual maturity? Don't stop valuing the Word of God. As soon as you do, you're going to go down like the Titanic. I, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. Okay, John 20, verse 29. Okay, well, this is Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas. He said, well, I'm not going to believe Jesus is really risen from the dead unless I can touch the, the place where the nails went in. And so Thomas is there with the disciples and Jesus suddenly shows up miraculously. And so in verse 27, uh, Jesus said to Thomas, well, reach here with your finger. See my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be unbelieving. Stop doubting. And believe. Well, he did. So Thomas answered him and said, Well, my Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Well, because you have seen me, do you now believe? Well, blessed are those who did not see me and yet believed. Well, now he's talking about the other disciples specifically, but... He's making a point. Faith doesn't have to have tangible evidence in order to believe. Faith does not require sensory uh, information. In fact, it says that in Hebrews. It says faith accepts as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Okay, well, I was at John chapter 20, verse 29. And the point being, we do that. If, if, if we, it, or I'll say it this way, if we do that, then we will receive from God. If, if, we're, if we stay faithful with that. And it may not happen just like that. It, it's, a, it's, it's a process. But there's a couple of other things about that. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12. 
12. And Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has granted me the strength and made me able for this, for his ministry, his apostleship, because he has considered me faithful and trustworthy, putting me into his service. Well, it almost sounds like that he's saying, well, I'm special, so God put me here. But then he goes on to say, no, I'm not special. Paul says, I'm not special at all. He said, even though I was formerly a blasphemer of our Lord and a persecutor of his church and a shameful and outrageous and violent aggressor toward believers. So that's not going to earn you brownie points with God. Okay. Yet I was shown mercy. Now I want you to watch this because we're going to have to dig into this a little bit. I was shown mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. Now, there's a saying in this world, ignorance is no excuse. Well, with God it kind of is, to a point, to, a, to an extent. It's like, okay, <clears throat> ignorance maybe is not going to uh, exempt you from every bad thing that happens, but, okay, what I'm referring to is the principle we call accountability. If you don't know something is that, that God says it's this way, if you, you don't know and you go ahead and do it, the consequences, the, the bad consequences that are going to come to you are not going to be as severe as someone who God has said, don't do that. You say, no, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I've got scripture for this. Keep the place here in 1 Timothy. Go to Luke chapter 12. I'm not recommending ignorance, by the way. But we live in an ignorant generation. I mean, in one sense, we're the most educated, most informed generation that's ever existed. And in another sense, we're the stupidest generation that has ever existed. It's like I've heard, heard people say, well, we don't have the sense to dig a fox, a, a, a post hole, <laughs> let alone a foxhole, or let alone a, a, a latrine. <laughs> okay, uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 47. The servant who knew his master's will that means he knew the word, and yet did not get ready or act in accordance with his will, will be beaten with many lashes. <clears throat> now, folks, if you're a Christian, that applies to end-time prophecy. So if you know, if you're informed about end-time prophecy, and you say, ah, I don't want to hear that, I don't want to go there, you know, that, that's, that, that makes me scared. I don't, I don't want to think about that. It's going to happen anyway. You know, it's coming. It's going to come to the whole world. Everybody is going to go through it. But because you knew and you did not get ready, it's going to be just that fact right there is going to make it more painful for you than it would be for the, the, the ignorant masses in, in Venezuela or wherever that just don't, have never even heard about it. See, but knowing and then disregarding, it says you're going to be beaten with many. It doesn't say you're going to hell. But I don't want to get beaten with many. If I got a choice of being beaten with many last years or been beaten with a few, I'll take the few over the many any day. In verse 48 it says, But he who did not know and did things worthy of a beating will receive only a few lashes. For everyone to whom much has been given much will be required. And to whom they entrust much, of him they will ask all the more. <clears throat> if you're one of the foolish virgins and you're left outside the door where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of the teeth, those people that are weeping and wailing and gnashing of the teeth are going to come to you and say, what's going on? And you're going to say, well... 
the Lord's come back, and, and you know, the, the tribulation has started. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what their, their response is going to be, but see, they're going to know. Knowledge brings responsibility. Accountability. Really, a re accountability is responsibility. I mean, this, this tells you right here. If you know, then you're a library. You're, 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 you're a source of information. You, you're, you're a concordance. You're a, an internet. You know, you're, you're a journalist. You're, you're a, a news broadcast. You say, well, I'm not all those things. Well, compare yourself then to somebody who's never heard what you've heard. And you say, well, why me? Because you accepted it. Because you believe it. And you know what? If you don't believe it, then you're not going to be uh, spouting it out. You're not going to be sharing it because, because God wants you to believe it, first of all. But this is talking about, um, well, it's talking about ignorance. But let's, let's go back to 1 Timothy, and let's see, he has some more to say about this. Verse 14, he said, well, the grace of our Lord uh, flowed out superabundantly to me. So if you're ignorant, God will give you a lot of grace to make up for your ignorance. And folks, let me say, there's a lot of things I'm ignorant about. There's a lot of things I don't know. But this says God's grace will superabundantly flow out to make up the difference for those things we don't know. You know, I, okay, you know, we're, we're hearing, th those of us that, that are in tune with end time prophecy, we're, we're hearing all these things going on and say, well, Lord, what do I do? Well, you know, how do you know which threat to prepare for? How do you know whether to prepare for nuclear war or an asteroid hit or, or martial law or famine or, or what? Or an alien invasion? How do you know which one of those is going to happen first or next? Well, you know, I'm ignorant of it. So God's grace is going to make up, is going to flow abundantly together with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful and trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance and approval that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners among whom I am the foremost. So, you know, Paul's kind of saying the same thing. Well, why me, Lord? Why did you choose me here? He says, well, you were ignorant, but you were open. When, when I hit you in the face there on the road to Damascus, you, you straightened up. And yet, for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example and pattern for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Well, there's a principle there. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I would summarize what he said there in verse 16 as this. He's saying, well, in the final analysis, it's not about me. I say, well, why me, Lord? He said, well, right, it's not about you. It's about my word. You know, it's, it's, it's not about what you are going to accomplish or what you think you're going or what you did that I've had to undo and, and uh, you know all the walk that you've walked it's not about any one of us that that's comforting to me and everybody has you know it says in James well we all sin every day without realizing it most of the time right well it's not about us it's about him and it's about his word and when we receive his word, that, that, that pushes along his plan for humanity. I mean, that, that's something he wants to happen. And if we receive his word, then we're doing what he wants to happen. And, and that should encourage us. 
that just, just by doing that, we're getting closer to the finish line. You know, like I said, I might be trudging along that narrow way while everybody else is running headlong off a cliff, but at least we're, we know we're going the right direction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. And Paul says that by them listening to the message that he preached, he said, you became imitators of us, and through us, imitators of the Lord. After you welcomed our message in the midst of great trouble and with joy supplied by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example <clears throat> to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has resounded from you and echoed like thunder, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia but in every place. The news of your faith in God has spread so that we never have to say anything about it. For they themselves report telling us what kind of a reception we had among you and how you turned from God to idols to serve the... Pardon me? To turn to God from idols. Yes, I got that backwards. I'm sorry. To serve the living and true God. They were idolaters. You know, they were in Greece, in Thessalonica. They, they worshipped Zeus and they worshipped all of these gods. And when the message of Jesus Christ came, they, they quit doing that. And that really sent ripples and waves in their culture. And <clears throat> our culture... In America, it's not what it used to be. Have you noticed? And by us continuing to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, it is just that right there shows. And he said, and, and you look forward confidently and wait for the coming of, of God's Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, Jesus who personally rescues us from the coming wrath and draws us to himself, granting us all the privileges and rewards of a new life with him. Okay, go to chapter 2. Verse 13. He says, For we also thank God continually for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of mere men, but as it truly is, the word of God, which is effectually at work in you who believe. Now that's another one of these why me things. Because in contemporary America, the gospel of Jesus Christ has made a lot of passes through our culture. I mean, I guess there's some people out there who've never heard of Jesus and never heard that he's the son of God and died for their sins and rose from the dead and so forth. But, but that message has been preached in America pretty thoroughly for a long time. And it, it's been... It was, in times past, the bedrock of our culture. So, when all of us repented, and all of us started going to that, those, Rome, those Owen Cain meetings in the Southwest YMCA or wherever it was, it's like other people maybe thought, well, you're just going, you're following a man. You're just listening, you know, you're, you're just enamored by this charismatic character over here. Uh, but no, we didn't go there because of the man. We went there because of the message. Right? I did. Okay. I, I, I mean, yeah, Owen, was a, he, was, he was a good old guy, you know. Reminded me a lot of the businessmen I knew from Stephenville. But that wasn't something that I was particularly attracted to. I wasn't, I wasn't going down that track. 
I mean, that wasn't the world I was really, I mean, everything I know about construction, I learned from Owen Cain. I, I didn't know zilch about construction before that, you know, and I wasn't, wasn't interested in learning construction. But my point is, what he said about the Thessalonians, I think we could all say about ourselves, is that we looked past the messenger to the message. A lot of Christians have trouble with that especially if they find out that the messenger has feet of clay just like they do. You know, it's fine. Oh, well, hey, they've got the same problem I do. Well, that's not supposed to happen. They're, they're, they're up here on this pedestal. No, no, you got that wrong. If they're, not on, they're not supposed to be on the pedestal. They're just bringing you a message that's on the pedestal. They're down here where you are, and the message is what's up there. And it, the Thessalonians got it. They weren't, they weren't worshipers of Paul. They were worshipers of Jesus. Okay? And then in verse 14 he says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, because you too suffered the same kind of persecution from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Okay, here's another aspect of why me and, and of faith. <coughs> Believing the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to put us in a category in this world. It's going to classify us. Then we are no longer just world citizens anymore. We're, we're members of the body of Christ. We're members of the kingdom of God. We are Christians in the truest sense. We are, we are being made like Christ. That's what Christian means. And as such, that's different than the world. We are aliens. It says we're strangers and aliens in this world. And all of us at some point in our spiritual journey... We signed on for that. We, we, we accepted that, okay, we're going to identify with some people that, um, you know, it might get us kind of, you know, rejected by some people. You know, it's like, uh, Susan, I remember you, you had a, a colleague that, um, when you were a school teacher, that... Uh, I don't know, that, that when it became, you, you were talking to that person about me, I think it was, and, and, and they said, oh, you mean he's become one of them too? And, and, and it's, like, it's like, yeah, they, they know. If they're not part of your group, it's like it says in Acts. It said, well, they held them in high esteem, but if they weren't a follower of Jesus, they weren't going to associate with those, those people over there. I remember the, the year that I gave my heart to to Jesus and my dad and our family, we went down to the University of Texas. He was doing postgraduate doctoral studies in math or something. And um, several years before, we had also gone down and I'd had some, some music theory and composition lessons with one of the people that was on the, on the faculty there. And during the, you know, the, the intervening years, I'd gotten born again. And so I went to see him in his, his electronic music studio. He'd worked with Carl Heinz Stockhausen and all of these electronic people. And, um, and he said, oh, what have you been doing? And I said, oh, I've been playing gospel music. And I said, and I started playing, you know, some gospel songs on his piano. I said, oh, whoa, stop that. We don't want anybody hearing that coming out of my studio. It's like, well, okay. And so I stopped. And like the, the, our little visit ended pretty quickly. But see, that's the thing. It's like if you're going to be a Christian, you're, you're going to associate with a, a culture, with a community that is foreign to the culture of this world. Right? So here, this is what we've said tonight. Well, why us? Because we agreed to that. And, and sometimes it's like you don't find out about it until you're already involved in it. And it's like, oh, well, mm, okay. And that's all God wants. He just wants us to say, okay. 
That's, that's why me. That's why you. Because you said, okay, to God. So, keep saying, okay, to God. Amen? So, Father, thank you for revealing this to us. And thank you for the grace.